Well, let's uh, take our uh, Bibles this evening, if you would, and turn with me to um, the Gospel of John and uh, chapter number 12. John chapter number 12. We have been uh, studying this uh, subject of prayer, and um, again, this uh, series is in the School of Prayer with Christ. Now, the disciples were those who were following Jesus Christ, but the idea of following Jesus Christ is not just an observation and a uh, mental understanding of what took place. Someone that follows Jesus Christ is someone that sees what he does and desires to do the same thing. And we find that the first century church, I believe, learned this great lesson of prayer because the first thing you find the church doing is praying. Uh, and so may the Lord help us because as we, uh, we considered, I think it was last year, we went through uh, the Sermon on the Mount. We talked about how this was uh, a message preached to the disciples and how they learned those lessons. But uh, now we're taking the life of Christ and we're seeking to follow Him and to observe His prayer life. And also a little later we'll talk about the instructions that He gave to His disciples concerning prayer. And we're seeking not just to be observers, but... Uh, to be duplicators of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now in John chapter number 12, we're going to uh, read, uh, if you would, uh, for sake of context, uh, we'll be dealing with verse 27 through 30 this evening, but uh, we'll begin uh, reading, if you would, in verse number 12. And so John chapter 12, verse number 12, and the Bible says, On the next day much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, sat thereon, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh, sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him, and that they had done these things unto him. The people therefore that, that was with him, when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it, said that it thundered. Others said, An angel spake unto him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. I want to consider and draw your attention to verse 27, where the Bible says, Now is my soul troubled. And um, we find that Christ is going to pray, uh, but the, as we study those two verses, verse 27 and 29, uh, I think it would do us well to find where are the words of his prayer. And notice he says, What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. I believe the prayer is just in verse 28. Father, glorify thy name. Now, we know that this prayer from the Lord was uh, prompted by the first words that he said in verse 27, Now is my soul troubled. 
And so I want to preach this evening on this subject, the prayer of a troubled soul. The prayer of a troubled soul. Now thus far as we've studied the life of Christ, we find that prayer is a part of his life, of his ministry, and it's clear. We saw that he began his ministry in prayer at his baptism. We find that he was praying. Now it was not an audible prayer. Uh, it was he prayed to himself as he was being baptized. We find uh, three different instances. We find him getting up in the morning before everybody else to pray. Uh, he knew that he had a busy day ahead. It was after the Sabbath day. He had healed people the night before, and he knew that multitudes would come the next day. And so he went apart to pray, preparing himself for the next day. We find also him taking uh, a, a moment in the middle of the day, in the middle of his busyness, to come apart to pray. And you also find him, after a busy day, spending all night in prayer. Now we noticed a few things. We noticed, first of all, uh, that the long prayers of our Lord are not recorded, and they all were private. And we find thus far that the public prayers of our Lord that were heard by the people that were there were very short. And so we've learned already that our prayer lives in private uh, ought to be the majority of our prayer time. And that our time in public prayer ought to be a short period of time. And in other words, uh, what takes place in our private time of prayer ought to just be a reflection, uh, a reflection in our public praying. Uh, and often that is contrary to our world. As a matter of fact, our world likes to boast, and often people, um, perhaps often I say, but uh, often uh, people like to pray long prayers in public, but I wonder how their prayer is in private. You see, the Lord has already given that example to us, where when He's gone apart Himself to pray, He spent uh, much time in that prayer, but when he, pr he prays in public, it is rather short. And here we find that this prayer is just a few words. In verse 28, Father, glorify thy name. Now we're going to deal with this in just a moment, and I'll explain here how we come to uh, those conclusions. But we understand here that uh, Jesus Christ has come into Jerusalem, and people we find have ushered him in, have uh, sung Hosanna, blessed is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Uh, and although he's well received by the multitudes, we know what they had in mind. What they had in mind was they wanted a king. They wanted someone to remove the Roman rule. And so his fame is really at its height at that moment as he comes into Jerusalem. If you remember, uh, often when he came to Jerusalem, he would come in secret. He would come not announcing that he was coming. If you remember, his, uh, his siblings told him, yeah, come to Jerusalem and announce yourself. And do the miracle so that people could observe. But we find, uh, even at times, the Pharisees and the scribes, they're searching Jerusalem for Jesus Christ, and He's nowhere to be found. And all of a sudden, He pops at the temple and He starts to teach. But this time, He comes into Jerusalem, and this is towards the end of His ministry, uh, and all the crowds are there. Everybody knows where Jesus is. They're ushering Him into Jerusalem, uh, and they're... Uh, singing his praises, uh, but we know whatever was in the minds of the people, we know that the mind of Christ was set on something different. And we know that this is just a few days removed when he would spend a, uh, some uh, a precious period of time with his disciples and be taken and be crucified at Calvary. And what he does here, as he's thinking about that moment according to verse number 27, he says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Now what is this hour? It's the crucifixion. It's the hour that he's been speaking of throughout his entire ministry, that he's been speaking of to his disciples, that there is one reason why he's here, and that is to seek and to save that which was lost. And as he's considering this hour that is about to come, he's going to pray a simple prayer. As his soul is troubled. And so I want us to consider first of all in our text the prompting of his prayer. The prompting of his prayer. Now I want us to know there's one word here, or really two words. The Bible says here, now is my soul troubled. And so we know the word troubled in order to understand the prompting of this prayer of our Lord. The word troubled here is... 
if you do a word study, Thayer's word study means to be agitated, to cause an inward commotion, to take uh, away one's calmness of mind, uh, to disturb, to make someone restless, uh, or to strike one's spirit with fear or dread, to affect with great pain or sorrow. And so the idea here is really the same that we will find a little later in the Garden of Gethsemane as he's sweating great drops of blood, as he's uh, uh, talking about the bitter cup that he's about to drink. We understand here the anguish of his soul. And so that anguish of his soul would prompt him to pray. And I think this is a great example for us because often... When there is an anguish in our lives, when there is trouble in the soul, the first thing we do is don't pray. At least that's not the thing that comes automatically, but to the Lord it came automatically. I want us to consider, first of all, the character of his trouble. The Bible says here, is my soul troubled? And so we understand here that this was not a physical distress. This was a soul distress. It is evident in our lives that we are the most troubled by the physical distresses that we are in uh, rather than the spiritual distresses. You see, what Jesus Christ was considering here, although some people we could say he knew the suffering he was about to experience, I do not think that that's what his soul was troubled about. As you study the history of those that have gone before us who have suffered as martyrs, you'd find them as they're burning at the, sca- at the stake in perfect peace, although they're, they're, they're going through a tremendous time of suffering. You see, the anguish of the Lord and the distresses of the soul, not because of the physical trouble that he was about to experience, but because he would be made sin for us who knew no sin. You see, when the soul is troubled, we must run to God. Now, that's the character of his trouble. It is a soul was troubled. But number two, we see the cause of his trouble. Uh, now, what is it that caused his soul to be troubled? Though The Bible tells us in verse 27, Father, notice, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Now, we understand that Christ is speaking of the cross and his sacrifice, which was to take place a few days later. Uh, in Matthew 26, 38, the Bible says, as he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, about to be taken and betrayed by Judas, then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Uh, Matthew Henry put it this way. He says, The sin of our soul was the trouble of Christ's soul. The trouble of his soul was, des- was destined to ease the trouble of our soul. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, the Bible says, For he, God, hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, the cruel mocking and the scourging was not what troubled the soul of Christ. The sin-hating God would become sin for us, who knew no sin, the one whose righteousness judges the wickedness of men would, not be, would now become that sin for us. What God hates, He bore for us. And so that caused, no doubt, great anguish of soul. John Butler put it this way, he says, The greatest suffering of Calvary was spiritual, not physical. Some preachers and evangelists have become very eloquent in describing the bloody details of Christ's physical death as though that was the greatest suffering that Christ uh, 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 suffered on Calvary. But the physical suffering of Calvary, though great, his suffering was mild in comparison to the great spiritual suffering the sinless Son of God experienced when the sin of the world was laid upon him. We simply cannot feel the repulsiveness of being made a curse for us. Sin does not bother us like it does a holy God. It was the spiritual pain that swept over him that greatly upset him and drove him to pray. And so as we think about this occasion, Jesus Christ is going to say a few simple words in prayer to his Father, and we see that it was prompted by the sorrow or the trouble of his soul. And this is a perfect Example for us that when we are troubled in the soul, that what we ought to consider above anything else is to 
address our Heavenly Father. So we see the prompting of his prayer, but secondly, we see the pondering before his prayer. Now some have said that his prayer began here in verse 27, Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. But I really, I don't believe that that is actual prayer. I believe he's pondering what he's about to say. Uh, notice he says, uh, verse 27, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? In other words, what am I going to say? My soul is troubled, what am I going to say? My soul is troubled, it is prompting me to pray, what am I going to pray? You know, that's a good question for us. When we are troubled, uh, in Romans chapter number 8, the Bible says that often when we come to God in prayer, when we are going through suffering, we know not what we ought to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And so we have to understand that there are times that that is a good question to ask when we are troubled, is to ask this question, what shall I say? And so we see, first of all, the carefulness of the prayer. Uh, in verse 27, he says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? It is often in the time of trouble and distress that the heart of man wanders away from God. It is during the time of trouble that the tongue becomes careless in addressing the Heavenly Father. Uh, for example, this is just an example that I could think of in the account of Job. Uh, he will stand as a positive illustration. Job's wife, however, can stand as the negative illustration of that point. In Job 2, 7, the Bible says this, So when Satan uh, forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown, and he took him a potsherd to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. Then his wonderful wife came with comforting words. No, that's not what it says. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain that integrity? Curse God and die. What an encourager. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God? And shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. You see, after this great period of sorrow, Job's wife did not consider her choice of words. The flesh was allowed to rule in the time of sorrow. And often I think that when we come through times of sorrow or anguish of the soul, often we say things in a careless way. We approach the Heavenly Father in a careless way as if, well, why is this happening to me? Why couldn't this not happen to somebody else? But notice the words of Job. God has blessed me with goodness, can he not allow evil to come into my life as well? And Christ here, as his soul is troubled, he says, what shall I say? The pondering of prayer. And it would do us good, I believe, uh, as we examine the life of our Lord, uh, to think about ourselves before we come to the Lord in prayer, to ponder and to not be careless about what we say to our Heavenly Father. So we see the carefulness of the prayer, but number two, we see the conflict of the prayer. And so he begins and he says this, and notice there's two parts, but those are really, they go together. The Bible says, Father, save me from this hour. And so here is the two uh, variations of what he could say. What shall I say? The first part is this, save me from this hour. So really that's the question mark. Or I could say this, but for this cause came I unto this hour. And so here's the proposition. What could I say? What shall I say as my soul is troubled? The first option is, save me from this. Or the second option could be, as he said, but wait a minute, I came for this hour. This is the reason why I came. And so I believe here we see the conflict of prayer. And I believe this is, represents the conflict that we all have. Because often what we want when we are troubled is we could ask for deliverance or perhaps we could ask for what does God want? What does God desire in my life? What does God want to accomplish? I believe that that is the great struggle of prayer. It is not saying that we ought not to pray for a physical deliverance. Now, we understand here the context of our Lord and His prayer. We understand that there would be a, a physical um, 
Uh, he would become a physical martyr. We understand the spiritual aspect of it, but I believe we can relate that to our own prayer life and to understand that often we are conflicted in our prayers. Where we can pray for the physical deliverance to the neglect of what God is trying to do in our lives. And so we see the conflict of the prayer, but number th three, we see the call of the prayer. He says, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Jesus Christ thought his ministry would constantly refer to this hour. The hour has not yet come. You remember? And he said that over and over again. But now he speaks of this hour that is about to come. And then we find later he says the hour has come. And so in consideration he says this is why I'm here. I am come for this particular hour. And so it, it, I believe it would do us good as before we come to the Lord in prayer to consider. God, we understand that there is the physical aspect and the physical deliverance that we want. But what about God's will? Is that what we want above our physical comfort? I think that's what Job wanted and I think that's what, that's what Job discovered. I think that's what also what Paul discovered. You remember? He prayed and asked God for physical deliverance. And God said no. And so Paul says that I, I learned that my uh, uh, God's strength was made perfect in my weakness. Therefore, I will, I will rejoice. I will gladly rejoice in the present infirmity, in the distresses that I have, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And so although there was that physical prayer for deliverance, he understood in prayer that there was something that God spiritually was trying to do in his life. And so it would do us well. We, we see not only the prompting of his prayer, it was the trouble of the soul, but the pondering before his prayer. And here comes the prayer. And so I believe here the prayer is found in verse 28. Father, that's his prayer, Father, glorify thy name. I point out to us once again that just as the last prayer that we studied, it was short, but yet it was filled with truth. For a prayer to be spiritual, it does not need to be long. But it does need to speak truth. Precisely and concisely. Father, glorify thy name. That's his prayer. I believe that is the prayer of the troubled soul. And I believe that for us in this example, it ought to be the prayer of our troubled soul. Father, glorify thy name. Now I want us to consider here, that's the priority of his prayer. You see, the priority in our, uh, in our Lord's prayer here is seen in two ways. First of all, those words, Father, glorify thy name. We see, first of all, it gives honor to God. It gives honor to God. The chief concern of this prayer was the glory of the Father. Christ could have asked to be saved from that hour, but that would not have brought about the glory of the Father. Why? Because we knew what the, glory, the, what the will of the Father was. Uh, he was appointed unto this hour, that, that hour of suffering where He would become sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. And so we understand the honor of God was in, his, was in view. He says this, Father, glorify thy name. Well, what does name mean here? Name, I believe here, represents all of the attributes and the character of God. His name. Now, there are many names that we find throughout the Word of God, but His name is representative of who He is. It is the same as the person. His name is the same as the person. And so... When we pray to God to be glorified, it had better be with the thought that we mean that God is to be glorified through us. Think about it. He said, Father, glorify thy name. But how would the name of God be glorified? Through his crucifixion. You see, we want others to also glorify God. God. 
But we must be willing to first pray that we ourselves will be that which honors God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Whether ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. You see, those who are the heroes of every story are not out to glorify God, but to glorify self. I was reading a commentary and I thought I'd pick this out. He said, many preachers in the pulpit do more self-exalting than God-exalting. They speak much about themselves. And often even in our prayer, if we're not careful, we speak much about ourselves and very little about the glory of God. And it seems to us as we pray that often what comes across in the prayer is we are more interested in our comforts and uh, in the ease of our life than we are in the glory of God. And we become disinterested in what if God could be glorified through this trouble. And so we see in those words, Father, glorify thy name, that at the chief center of his prayer, the chief concern of his prayer was the honor of God. But number two, we see in this prayer also the humility of Christ. We understand that there is no one that has been as humble as our Lord has been. Philippians 2, 5 tells the believer, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. That's God. He made himself of no reputation and became um, obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Every knee should bow with things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so understand his humility was so great. Why? Because of his position. God becoming a man without ceasing to be God and he humbled himself. And here he becomes obedient to death and he submits himself. He says, Father, glorify thy name. It would only be in doing the will of God that the Father would be glorified. And so it is in our lives. It is only in us doing the will of God that God is glorified. You see, in this prayer, we see that Christ was willing to suffer in order that the Father be glorified. In order to glorify God, we must be prepared to sacrifice our comforts and experience suffering if need be. Furthermore, there should be no claim on our part if we have to suffer for God to be glorified. Spurgeon wrote in this, concerning this prayer, he says, The prayer means I am willing to be made nothing of, so that thy will may be done. I am willing to be as the one dead and buried, forgotten and unknown, if thou mayest be magnified. God will never be honored when we come to him with a proud and arrogant spirit. And so we see that this prayer is, Father, glorify thy name, speaks volumes. It speaks of the chief concern of the believer when we approach the Father in prayer. Are we interested in the glory of God? God's glory could be seen in the fact that He heals us. That is true. But God's glory can also be seen in the testimony that you have of the grace of God that He's given you through a difficult time. Both can speak of the glory of God. And we must be aware of that. Now following this brief prayer from the Lord, we have an immediate response from the Father. Notice the Bible tells us in verse uh, number 28, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. You see, so following this brief prayer, uh, the, the Father responds from heaven. There came a voice from heaven and says, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Now, what is the it referring to? His name. I have, past tense, glorified my name. I've glorified it. And I will glorify it, his name, again. Now, I think it is interesting to note as I was reading someone point out, it says three times 
the Father spoke audibly unto the Son. At the beginning, in the middle, and at the end of his messianic ministry. And in each case, it was in view of his death. At the Jordan, at his baptism, Christ went down symbolically into the, the place of death. In the Holy Mount, the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah had talked with Christ about his decease uh, in Luke 9, 31. And here Christ, <coughs> <coughs> had just accounted that his hour was at hand. <coughs> and so we see that the three times that God spoke from heaven, all three times, there was a connection to the death of Christ. He said, I have both glorified it, his name, and I will glorify it again. You see, God in the past tense was glorified at the birth of Christ. If you remember in Luke 2.13, And suddenly there came with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And so we know at the birth of Christ, that's the past, the name of God was glorified. It was magnified. It was exalted. God was glorified in the life of Christ throughout His ministry. In Luke 5, 22, And immediately He arose up before them and took up that whereon He lay and departed to His own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed. And they glorified God. And they were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. Luke 7, 16, And there came a fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen among us, and that God hath visited His people. Matthew 15, 31, And when they saw the dumb to speak, the maimed to be whole, the lame to walk, and the blind to see, and they glorified the God of Israel. You see, as Christ was doing the will of the Father, the name of the Father was being glorified. It had been glorified. His name had been glorified. Why? Because Jesus says, I do always those things which please the Father. His name had been glorified. But he says, and I will glorify it again. Now we know what is in view. The cross is in view. Calvary is in view. And you say... Was God glorified then? Oh, yes, He was. Why? Because the wrath of God was satisfied with the sacrifice of Christ. The Bible tells in Isaiah 53, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise Him. He hath put Him to grief. And so we see here that it is clear that the name of God is glorified and He will glorify it again. We know in the, in the, uh, even the future prophetically to us, we know that His name again will be glorified. And so we understand even in the Lord's prayer and His instruction to His disciples, He says that one of the chief concerns of our time of prayer ought to be the glory of God. And so I wonder for us, is that true in our lives? I think that much of our prayer ought to be, yes, we can pray for God's healing. We can pray for God's deliverance. But we could, should not do that to the neglect of His glory. In other words, our prayer should be something like, God, would you heal us? But if not, would you still glorify your name? But if not, would your name be exalted? But if not, would you help me to know your grace? You see, we cannot think in our prayer lives that because God does not answer a physical need, that somehow God cannot be glorified. Then, it wouldn't be true of our, Lord, our own Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who went Himself through suffering. Why? His chief concern was the glory of God. And for our lives... As we consider the, the prayer of the troubled soul. What is the prayer of the troubled soul? The prayer of the troubled soul is simply this. Father, glorify thy name. Are you troubled? Have you ever been in a time of trouble? The Lord Jesus Christ gives us an example of the prayer of a troubled soul. May we seek 
for the name of our Father to be glorified. And I believe that that changes our perspective as we pray. Why? Because we don't come in our prayer defeated, saying, well, if God doesn't do this, then it's all bad. No. When our chief concern is the glory of God, we know He doeth all things well. And it changes our mind as we approach the Lord in prayer. And so may the Lord help us with that aspect of our prayer life.